Do you ever wonder how much risk your child is at when it comes to them being nearsighted? In my first video on myopia management, I introduced you to the all important fight against myopia for our children. In this video, I will go into the factors associated with myopia when we do a risk assessment for a child. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Natalie Chai. This channel brings you the latest science-based education and treatments in dry eye, myopia management, and specialty contact lenses to help you understand why it should matter to you for optimal eye health, function, comfort, and even beauty. We learned from my introduction video that myopia is one of the most common ocular conditions and is already rising to epidemic numbers in certain regions, quickly spreading to the rest of the world, becoming a pandemic. I don't know about you, but for me, when I found out I had myopia and started to wear glasses in grade three, it was considered a relatively normal thing to have as a kid. The only concern that my optometrist had for me at the time was that I was just going to get thicker and thicker glasses as I grew up and told me to turn on the lights when I was reading. My parents also weren't too thrilled with seeing my prescription jump incrementally each year. Unfortunately, during those times, myopia management was not a thing. Now as an adult, I am left with a minus eight prescription and about a 40 time greater risk of developing myopic maculopathy as I age. I want to emphasize that myopia is not normal. It requires immediate intervention and we should not be sloughing it off. Understanding the risk factors gives us as optometrists a pretty good idea as a okay predictor to your child's chances of developing myopia. But remember, it is not a guarantee as we just don't have a crystal ball when it comes to your child's future. To know what the risk factors are, we first need to understand what is normal. Development of refractive error. Did you know that your eye is not fully developed at birth? Eye growth continues from the moment you enter the world and the refractive error or the measurable prescription of the eye changes almost on a daily, especially in newborns. The changes typically shifts gradually towards emetropia. So emetropia is the state of the eye where no correction is required as the parallel lights entering the eye is focused directly on the back of the eye, the retina. In the first six months, what is considered normal is having a low amount of hyperopia, about a plus two. This is caused from having a shorter eyeball where the light rays focus behind the eye. Now reaching one year of age and for the next several years after that, we see a steady reduction in hyperopia. At about school age, age five to seven, most children will have a refractive area in the low hyperopic range from zero, which is you know considered perfect vision, to about that plus two. Years following, the evidence has shown that in populations with relatively low to modest education levels, that refractive error usually maintains at this level throughout the teenage and adult years. The more alarming statistic is that in first world countries, we are seeing that the refractive error will shift toward becoming myopic and will progress for a period of time, if not already. Myopia onset. The prevalence of myopia is actually very low at less than 5% in children younger than six years old. This is even true in regions like East Asia and Singapore, where the prevalence of myopia is considered alarmingly high. The incidence of myopia increases dramatically in at-risk populations from approximately six years of age. There is a possible link between this age group and the start of schooling. Let's define these terms because it's quite important to know the difference when I'm talking about prevalence and incidence. So prevalence is the proportion of people who have the condition at a particular period of time. Incidence is the proportion of people who develop the condition at a particular period of time. This is precisely the reason why it is important for our children to be seen on a yearly basis. Myopia progression. The progression has been studied less when compared to the literature surrounding prevalence and onset, however, is starting to become very important. It helps us predict and identify the children to closely monitor if a child will progress towards high myopia. We already learned from my first video that with high myopia, there comes a higher risk factor for developing ocular complications that could lead to blindness. 
Based on a review of a few studies, a generalization can be made when it comes to progression. Greater myopic progression rates are expected at younger ages. So a child will probably progress about minus 0.5 to minus one or a full step of a diopter per year in about six to nine year olds. Versus in older ages, a child will probably progress at minus 0.25 to minus 0.75 diopters per year for those older than 10 years of age. Risk factors. Over the years, there have been many different ways of assessing risk for myopia. Most commonly, it has been categorized as either genetics versus environmental factors. Other studies have separated the factors as uncontrollable versus controllable. As our understanding has increased significantly, evidence suggests that we should be equally concerned to address the issues around both the onset and the progression. As such, a more accurate way of categorizing the risk factors are the risk factors underneath for myopia onset and the risk factors known to influence myopia progression. Myopia onset or pre-myopia risk factors. Now in no particular order, we'll go through all of them here. Number one, family history or the genetics. Having one myopic parent increases risk by threefold, while having two myopic parents doubles the risk sixfold. Number two, environment. Two key environmental influences are time spent outdoors and the amount of near work. Having less than 90 minutes a day spent outdoors increases risk, especially if combined with more than three hours a day spent on near work activities outside of school time. There was a study that determined that children from urban environments have 2.6 times higher odds of myopia than those from rural environments. Other findings that were significantly associated as a risk factor included population density, home size, and housing type. Number three, binocular vision. Now this is an area that determines how well the two eyes are working together as a team. We look at the child's accommodation, or otherwise known as the ability to focus, and the child's convergence, so the ability to bring your eyes inward efficiently when looking at something close. Then we typically look to see how the two systems work in relation to each other, known as the accommodative convergence ratio, or ACA ratio. There has been a correlation that children with higher ratios have an increased risk of myopia development within one year of over 20 times. We typically see this finding in children with what we call an esophoric posture. This is defined as a natural inward deviation of the eye. Sometimes we would wave a paddle back and forth between their eyes. That's what we're checking for. Another feature associated with an increased risk of myopia onset is having a leg of accommodation. So this is where the child tends to focus behind the object of interest rather than at the object of interest. This tends to occur only at the time of onset. Though the findings in binocular vision are promising, there still needs to be a lot more research when it comes to the assessment of risk for the child. Number four, current refraction. Now the most significant risk factor for myopia onset is if a child has plus 0.5 diopters or less of hyperopia at age six or seven. This risk is independent of family history and visual environment. In studies, it has been shown that the fastest rate of refractive change in myopic children actually occurs in the year before onset. So this means the child who is less hyperopic than age normal should be monitored very closely, especially if the child has one or more of these risk factors. Let's look at the risk factors associated with myopia progression. Number one, age. The younger a child becomes myopic, the faster they will progress. Children at seven years old will progress at least one full step or one diopter per year with this at the half of 0.5 diopter per year by age 11 to 12. Number two, family history. Again, children having two myopic parents have been shown to be the fastest progressors when compared to the child with only one myopic parent and lesser yet if the child has no myopic parents. Number three, environment. Once a child has been myopic, the amount of time outdoors has been shown to not be effective in slowing down the progression, 
although other studies have shown that time outside may slow the rate of progression. In regards to near work, at less than 20 centimeters working distance and for 45 minutes or more have been linked with more myopia progression. Interestingly, the connection is quite weak. Number four, ethnicity. There is a suggestive link in research between Asian ethnicity and faster progression of myopia, with higher worldwide prevalence in this group of people. Number five, binocular vision. Some studies looking at addressing the issue of accommodative lag or esophoria has shown some success suggesting that some aspect of binocular function may be a risk factor for progression. So to summarize underneath myopia progression, once a child becomes myopic, it is 100% that they will progress. So the idea with that thinking is to start some sort of a myopia management strategy as early as possible, as is demonstrated strongly in the evidence. Remember, any amount of myopia is abnormal and we should not sit around and wait for any signs of progression to start treatment. We should start it right now. Final thoughts. With all the risk factors listed, the strongest link in literature continues to be the age of onset of myopia. However, remember that these are all predictors and is not a guarantee to how your child will respond. So not all myopes, young myopes, will experience progression to high myopia and vice versa. There is always a gray zone. For instance, some children will start later in life at about 11 years or older, and some may actually start in their adult years. Another common perception is that myopia tends to stabilize in the late teenage years. There is definite truth to that, just because it is known that our growth spurt kind of stops around that age period. However, there are patients whose myopia will start in adulthood and continue to progress through adulthood. These individuals include those doing intense near work and those who have higher degrees of myopia. So I think that is enough evidence-based studies out there to hopefully convince you that myopia is indeed a real thing and something that should not be ignored. When you visit your optometrist specifically for myopia management, we will usually start by evaluating risks first and foremost. At least a good chunk of my assessments for my patients is spent in this area to determine the treatment option best suited for the child. That's it for me. I hope you learned something and if you have any more questions questions around myopia and the risk factors specifically for your child, let me know. If this is your first time to the channel and if you're getting value from it, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell just to make sure that you don't miss out on my next YouTube video every Thursday. I hope you have a wonderful week and we'll see you next time.